A funeral for the Brazilian black man killed by security guards takes place in Porto Alegre. Protesters in Colombia mark a year since the national strike against the government of Ivan Duque. And tens of thousands of Taiwanese people rally against government measures. Welcome to Telesur, I'm Carla Gonzalez. This is from the South. In Brazil, the funeral for Joao Alberto Silveira Freitas, a black man killed by security guards on Friday, has taken place in Porto Alegre. Freitas was killed by two white security guards outside a Carrefour supermarket. A video posted on social media showed one guard restraining him while the other inflicted repeated blows to his face. Other clips showed a guard kneeling on top of Freitas' back. According to local media reports, paramedics attempted to resuscitate the 40-year-old man at the scene, but it was already too late and he succumbed to his wounds. Protesters in Colombia have marked a year since the national strike against the government of Ivan Duque. Hundreds of people, including teachers, students and workers' unions, protested in the streets of Bogota. They marched with drums and banners denouncing inequality. Riot police in black uniforms from the SMAT unit threw tear gas at protesters who fired back with stones and Molotov cocktails. A police car was vandalized as protesters denounced the SMAT for decades of police brutality. On Monday, students will also take to the streets to denounce the murder of Dylan Cruz a year ago by Colombia's riot police. We are more students, because students are the future of the country. And it is not simply seeing the fact that this is happening, but putting on our shoes, supporting it. Because it's a national strike, you may be fine, but someone else is not well, and it's thinking about equity. After so many deaths, after so much police abuse, clearly the students, the people, and the citizens are tired. Here, not only are there students from the National University, but there are other Colombians, Colombians who are tired and annoyed by police abuse. I think that at some point Colombia had to wake up, if it did a year ago, and is no longer doing it now. Maybe because of the pandemic, that's fine. But I think that students now, we don't care about that. We care more than a virus or whatever. Seriously, the future of Colombia. Hundreds of Guatemalans have burned down parts of the Congress building to protest the approval of the 2021 budget and demand the resignation of President Alejandro Yamate. The incident came as about 7,000 people were demonstrating in front of the National Palace in Guatemala City against the budget. Protesters say the budget was negotiated and passed by legislators in secret, while the Central American country was distracted by the fallout of back-to-back -back hurricanes and the COVID-19 pandemic. Among various cuts, Guatemalans were angered because lawmakers approved $65,000 to pay for meals for themselves by cut funding for coronavirus patients, education and human rights agencies. Security agents fired tear gas at protesters and there were people who were injured, carrying the national flag and banners that said no more corruption, Yamate out, and they messed with the wrong generation. The protesters filled the central square in Guatemala City in front of the old palace. President Yamate said he had been meeting with various groups to present changes to the budget. I was walking and they grabbed me. I didn't do anything. I have my constitutional right to strike. We are tired. There is no other way to show our repudiation, how fed up we are. We are tired of so much abuse by the authorities. Before the protests turned violent, Guatemala's Vice President Guillermo Castillo urged President Yamate to resign over his approval of an almost $13 billion budget, the largest in the country's history. Yamate had not responded publicly to the proposal and Castillo did not share the president's reaction, but said he would not resign alone. Unfortunately, we had not success in today's meeting, and I will therefore like 
to make my approach very clear to the president. It is in the country's interest that we both tender our resignations, him as president and I as vice president of the republic. But let's do it together. I have made it very clear to the president that things are not right on many government issues and the decisions that have been taken I don't agree with. I have not been consulted on them because of the lack of communication we have with the president. This is also due to a citizen demand. We have been told that things are not as people hope. The Mexican Senate has approved a landmark recreational cannabis legalization bill in a landslide vote. Lawmakers are now rushing to secure final approval before the end of the current congressional session in December. The legislation would let users carry up to 28 grams and grow as many as four plants at home. Sales to adults in authorized businesses would be allowed, provided the product abides by maximum levels of psychoactive ingredients. Lawmakers in favor of the bill said it will also support indigenous communities as they will no longer have to be part of an illegal cannabis market. But the use of cannabis will continue to be banned in public spaces if there are minors, and also in a 500-meter radius of schools, shopping centers, parks, and government buildings. We'll take a short break now. Don't go away. Welcome back. Let's continue with news. Millions of people in Burkina Faso are voting in an election marred with accusations of electoral fraud. President Rock Mark Christian Caboret is expected to win re-election. The opposition has threatened to reject the results over what they called a huge operation orchestrated by those in power to carry out massive fraud. More than 6.5 million will be able to vote, but the turnout is expected to be much lower due to an armed insurgency linked to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State group. This has forced the Electoral Commission to close polling stations in the north and eastern regions of the country. All these facts challenge us. This is why we decided yesterday to file a complaint with the prosecutor of FASO. But we are well aware of the slowness of our judicial institutions. What we want is not to wait two or three weeks after the elections for a decision. We want it to be decided now, and it is you, Burkinapes, and your vigilance that will help us to do that. Dozens of workers at the South African Broadcasting Corporation have protested against the management's plans to retrench hundreds of workers. The workers said the retrenchments would have a devastating impact on them and their families. The state broadcaster last week issued retrenchment notices to 400 permanent workers and canceled the contracts of more than a thousand freelancers, citing financial challenges. The workers have vowed to continue protesting until management withdraws all the dismissal letters issued to workers. Dozens of protesters have rallied in the Angolan capital, Luanda, demanding an end to government corruption and police violence. They have accused the government of failing to take decisive action against public officials accused of engaging in corrupt practices. They also denounced the unwillingness to punish police officers who assaulted protesters last month. The demonstrations will not stop in Luanda. That's to say that on December 10th, there will be another, and we invite all those people who are at home, young saints, young people who know that the country is not in good shape to show up on December 10th. Saudi Arabia is hosting the G20 summit this weekend with the virtual forum dominated by efforts to tackle the coronavirus pandemic and the worst global recession in decades. World leaders have gathered virtually as international efforts intensify for a large-scale rollout of coronavirus vaccines after a breakthrough in trials. It also comes as calls grow for G20 nations to plug a $4.5 billion funding shortfall. Saudi Arabia's King Salman presides over the meeting and climate change is expected to be among the issues topping the agenda. 
According to organizers, G20 nations have contributed with more than $21 billion to combat the pandemic, which has infected 56 million people globally and left 1.3 million dead. And they have also injected $11 trillion to safeguard the affected world economy. Various world leaders prepared video messages addressed to the G20 summit in Riyadh. Chinese President Xi Jinping on Sunday called for the G20 to take the lead on climate change as he addressed world leaders during the virtual conference. Second, we could deepen the transition toward clean energy. China applauds Saudi Arabia's initiative on circular carbon economy and supports the shift to low carbon energy in the post-COVID era to achieve the goal of sustainable energy for all. China has put in place the world's biggest clean energy system and has led the world in the output and sales of new energy vehicles for five years running. Under the recommendations for formulating China's 14th five-year development plan and the long-range goals for 2035, China will pursue clean, low-carbon, safe and efficient use of energy and accept the growth of new energy and green industries to promote greener economic and social development in all respects. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has also highlighted his country's efforts to combat climate change during his speech at the summit. India is not only meeting our Paris Agreement targets, but also exceeding them. India has taken concrete action in many areas. We have made LED light popular. This saves 38 million tons of carbon dioxide emission per year. Smoke-free kitchens have been provided to over 80 million households through our Ujwala scheme. This is among the largest clean energy drives globally. There are efforts to eliminate single-use plastics. Our forest cover is expanding. The lion and tiger population is increasing. We aim to restore 26 million hectares of degraded land by 2030. Argentina's President Alberto Fernandez has announced that his country purchased millions of doses of COVID-19 vaccines to protect 10% of the population. Argentina actively engaged in the COVAX mechanism of the COVID-19 Act Accelerator and has already made the upfront payment for the purchase of 9 million doses of vaccines to cover 10% of the population. In this regard, phase three of the clinical trials of three vaccine candidates are being developed in our country. And we will also produce the vaccine developed by the University of Oxford, which will be distributed equitably from 150 to 200 million doses to Latin American countries. Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador has pleaded for free and universally available vaccines and warns about excessive lockdowns as he addressed the summit. Health is a fundamental human right that the state must guarantee. Medical care, vaccines and medicines must be free and universally available. Guarantee freedom in all circumstances and abandon the temptation to impose authoritarian measures such as excessive lockdowns or curfews. The economic rescue must be done from the bottom up, first helping the poor. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa called on developed nations to assist African countries to rebuild their economies that were negatively affected by the coronavirus pandemic and low oil prices. We look to the G20, international partners, and the international finance institutions to work with African countries to help them rebuild their economies. 
The African Union has proposed several measures, including debt relief in the form of interest payment waivers and deferred payments. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has called on G20 leaders to support the World Health Organization and calls for vaccines to be made available and affordable for all countries in order to contain the pandemic. In order to halt the pandemic, every country needs to have access to and be able to afford the vaccine. The funds pledged so far are not enough to achieve this. I therefore appeal to you all to support this important initiative. To this end, we need to sustainably strengthen the World Health Organization. We need reliable funding, better cooperation, greater independence, and the G20 can provide important, indeed crucial support in this area. If we stand together across the globe, we can control and overcome the virus and its impact. It is worth redoubling our efforts to achieve this. We have more stories coming up. Stay with us. Thank you for joining us again. Let's continue. Tens of thousands of Taiwanese protesters have marched in Taipei in an anti-government demonstration targeting a range of measures. Protesters are angry over labor issues, media freedom, and a recent controversial decision to allow the import of U.S. pork containing ractopamine, a feed additive used by U.S. farmers to promote leaner meat in livestock. The drug is banned by the European Union, but it is legal in the United States. Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen, made the announcement to lift restrictions on U.S. pork in August in an effort to pave the way for a future bilateral trade part with the United States. Imports of American pork will affect Taiwanese pig farmers and vendors very seriously because ractopamin is not allowed here. But now our government wants to import them. It's a slap in the face for our farmers. I'm a mom from Taichung. I'm here in Taipei for the next generation protesting against the import of pork containing ractopamin because it's very poisonous. And Tsai Ing-wen now wants us to eat this kind of poisonous food. So I'm here to protest. In other news, hundreds have taken to the streets in Kyrgyzstan to protest a proposed constitution that critics say would empower the presidency and damage freedom of speech. Several hundred protesters who gathered in the center of the capital, Bishkek, held up signs decrying a constitution a reference to the absolutist rulers who dominated Central Asia for centuries. Constitutional amendments currently undergoing public discussion would return cabinet-forming powers to the president and allow incumbent leaders to run for office. Initiators say the draft constitution should be put to a referendum on January 10th, the same day that the country is holding presidential elections. This constitution is a new project that is now being proposed. It has a very simple goal, to push educated people out of the country, to leave in the country only those people who will accept without any critical thinking about power, to support the candidate, support the caliphate. The fact is that the proposed referendum is a new draft constitution that came out of nowhere. And who knows who its authors are? This is a completely illegitimate procedure and it is necessary to return it to its legal course. Thousands of Israelis took to the streets on Saturday night to continue months of protests demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Brave in cold, wet weather, several thousands gather outside Netanyahu's official residence in Jerusalem. Some protesters carried makeshift submarines, referring to one of Netanyahu's graft scandals, which is connected to the purchase of warships and submarines from a German conglomerate. The Prime Minister faces corruption charges and protesters also accuse him of mishandling the coronavirus crisis. Troops from Azerbaijan have entered a district bordering Nagorno-Karabakh that was previously home to Armenian separatists as part of a Russian broker deal to end weeks of fighting in the region. 
Troops on Friday moved into the district of Agdam, one of three to be seated. As part of last week's peace deal, Armenia agreed to return some 15 to 20 percent of the Nagorno-Karabakh territory captured by Azerbaijan in recent fighting, including the historical town of Shusha. Armenia will also hand over the Kalbajar district, wedged between Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia on November 25th, and the Lachin district by December 1st. Clashes between Azerbaijan's forces and Armenian separatists broke out in late September in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. The fighting lasted six weeks, leaving thousands dead and displaced. Do you think it's easy to be a martyr? It is difficult. The war is over. The agreement was signed. Excellent. Very good. Because my son is in the town of Kojavent in Nagorno-Karabakh now. He's still there. I cried and I was happy. I was crying tears of joy. I hope the other districts will be returned. We are all calm now. We are all happy. Azerbaijan's president, Ilyam Aliyev, has expressed gratitude to Russian President Vladimir Putin and his Turkish counterpart, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, for brokering the Nagorno-Karabakh ceasefire. The Azerbaijani army has achieved a brilliant military victory, and we move on to the plan of political settlement. I would like to express my gratitude to you as well as the leadership of Russia, President Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, for his active personal participation in the preparation and adoption of this important political document. We also welcome the active course of negotiations between the Russian Federation and Turkey on the establishment of a ceasefire monitoring center in Azerbaijan. Meanwhile, in Armenia, several thousand people have gathered again in the capital Yerevan to call for the resignation of Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan and to voice their opposition to a deal with Azerbaijan over the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh. The Armenian police had detained dozens of protesters on Friday at a similar rally in Yerevan, where demonstrators formed a human chain and blocked major roads. The agreement ended military action and restored relative calm to the breakaway territory. It is internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan, but populated and, until recently, fully controlled by ethnic Armenians. I returned from the military positions in Nagorno-Karabakh three days ago. We defended the positions and will defend them to the end. This later saw the country. Soon our platoon of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation will return from the Nagorno-Karabakh. Some the Propashinia keep saying the soldiers are with us. But soon it will become clear who is with whom. Today we gather here to demand the resignation of the traitor Nikol Pashinyan. A commander-in-chief who has been defeated has no right to remain at the helm of the country. In the United States, around 74 endangered sea turtles that became stranded on Cape Cod have been airlifted to rescue centers. Each fall at Cape Cod Bay in Massachusetts, hundreds of endangered sea turtles wash ashore hypothermic from the cold ocean temperatures, leading to the largest sea turtle stranding event in the world. The organization called Turtles Fly 2 and its volunteers have loaded up a record-breaking 74 sea turtles to be flown on a single private aircraft to rehabilitation centers along the eastern seaboard. Later, they will be released into the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Most of the turtles are Kemp's Ridley, the smallest and most endangered species in the world. You couldn't write a more horrifying script for everybody, really. I mean, this is what, you know, in a good year, we, we could deal with it and you could bring in more people, and now you can't. So now we have to deal with it. Each one of us, in our own way, has to find the time to recover from being out there, you know, all of the shifts and all of the walking, all of the lifting, and then get ready for the next, the next time and make sure we have the infrastructure and that we're able to move turtles around and, 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 and get that all done. Once you save one, it's, you know, you're just hooked. I mean, I find that the, my fellow volunteers, they'll do just about anything. You know, like, okay, it's five degrees out with a 30 mile an hour wind. Can you go out at 3 a.m.? 
you know, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> so it's for the turtles, you know, we love them. And with that, we end this news brief. But you can find all of our stories on our website, tellusforenglish.net. And we're also on social media. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Until next time.